between mean time to failure for hardware as compared to software. In hardware, when we say mean time to failure is uh, you uh, take the average over between zero to infinity. So it's kind of the time average. But in, in this case, this is an ensemble average. If you had a lot of uh, different software which have the same attributes, what would be the average? So it is an ensemble average, but still it is mean. Uh, okay, and let's define uh, reliability. Now there is the traditional duration of reliability. Which is equal to probability of no failures. Giving zero to t. And it is, uh, people use it, but it's, it's not very useful in uh, software. Unless it is, uh, you're talking about a single transaction. So if you are talking about what is the probability the software will not fail in the next two years, that almost doesn't uh, make sense because you, are, you can be practically guaranteed that if it's a piece of large software, it is going to fail hmm. within the next uh, six months. You can be almost sure, right? So if you have, a, uh, let's say if you had an early version of Windows, how many of you had uh, Windows uh, 95? So it, it would crash every year. Uh, few weeks, sometimes days, the uh, newer versions are much more stable, of course, right? Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is still a good definition, but it is of limited use. You will see sometimes transaction reliability. Probability that a single transaction will be executed correctly. testing the software for past uh, two weeks. But that could be misleading because you may have maybe the number of people involved in testing it varies with time. So it may be uh, better instead of using calendar time to use a more effort based, me based measure. For example, it might be better to use man hours. That would be a better measure. Actually, I should maybe make it a person hour. So, uh, but I guess people have been using the term man hours. So, person hours. And uh, then CPU time. This is another good one. So, you record the number of, you record the CPU execution time that you uh, have spent doing testing, and that would be a good measure. So you will find some data in terms of CPU time. It's also a better. Yeah, you can also use uh, the number of person hours in terms of testing. Or sometimes, if you think the test effort is reasonably constant, you could use uh, calendar time as a measure of time. So whenever you say test time, we are assuming you are using some suitable measure of uh, time. Okay, let's talk about uh, defect uh, density. Okay, what is the typical uh, defect density? Any suggestions? 
Okay, let me ask a different question. You want to buy some software, what kind of defect density are you are willing to accept? Okay, here are, let me uh, throw some numbers. Here are some numbers. Uh, now, one uh, thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times, the numbers that you see for defect density are actually estimates. So, these are not, you cannot uh, um, insist on these numbers being precisely accurate because uh, they are estimated. So, for example, if you want to know uh, defect densities of uh, different uh, versions of Microsoft Windows, you should define it. You should find one of our papers that, uh, uh, and we have, we actually looked at uh, defect densities of uh, different versions of Windows. We thought that we will not be able to find it because typically Microsoft doesn't uh, like people to get this information, but. Sometimes the numbers slip out, so there are some sort of rumors that uh, go on. And so we took the approach that if a rumor has not been denied by Microsoft <laughs> and it has been published, we take that as a uh, we take that as a, a, a data point. And uh, so we did, we wanted to uh, do that analysis, and we wanted to see. What fraction of defects are uh, security vulnerabilities? So we wanted to calculate the ratio of uh, vulnerabilities related to all, vulnerabilities are security related defects as opposed to all different kinds of defects. So, and number of vulnerabilities is easy to find. Number of defects is much harder to find, so we have to rely on various sources. So, but we were able to dig out numbers for uh, different uh, versions of uh, Microsoft Windows. And so we, we calculated the, uh, the defect density for different versions. And we also calculated, we introduced a term called vulnerability density. So we also calculated vulnerability density. And we reported that in one of our papers. But anyway. And so basically, and also we calculated some ratio of what fraction of defects are vulnerabilities. So we have also uh, looked at that. But anyway, let's look at some defect density numbers. Now it is likely that if you look, you will find some numbers that are uh, different. And uh, so there are really no really good reliable numbers, but here's what we have seen. Beginning after unit testing, before you start your uh, unit testing, and this is unit testing, so you do something earlier, typical number is 16 per thousand lines of code. So you have a couple of thousand lines of code. You probably have something like 32 defects. Now there's a question of what are the factors that control defect density, which we are going to talk about later. But let me uh, give you some typical numbers. Okay, and after release, after release, 2.0 defect that is uh, frequently mentioned. It is not always acknowledged because 2.0, that's a large number of defects, right? For a thousand lines of code, you have uh, two defects. Highly tested programs, it could be something like 0.33. To do a nice job of testing, it is 0.33 per thousand lines of code. NASA Space Shuttle, they had a, um, a rigorous program to estimate defect density, and they found it to be, and they did really thorough testing, 0 0.1 per 
per thousand lines of code. So if the software has really thoroughly been tested, for example, if you look at Microsoft Windows, as you would think Microsoft Windows, especially the earlier versions, they were a piece of junk. <laughs> but uh, actually, they have been thoroughly tested. And if you uh, look at their uh, defect densities, so remember, uh, you need high reliability in programs that are critical, right? NASA software is critical. On the other hand, you also need a very high reliability for software that are widely used. Like Microsoft Windows. Okay, so Microsoft Windows crashes, who cares? But actually, it makes the, the impact because there's so many people use, use it. So, uh, so there's an enormous impact on uh, the users, if you consider all of them. So anything that is uh, very popular, it needs to be highly reliable. So typically, you should uh, expect numbers like this for a uh, popular uh, piece of software. And uh, now let's talk about software reliability modeling. Now when we uh, look at uh, software reliability, uh, if you look at uh, uh, some of the books or articles that talk about software reliability engineering, you will notice that uh, a lot of times they basically uh, look at the software reliability growth process. And you will come across software reliability growth models. But actually, you can have uh, two different uh, class of approaches for estimating reliability and for managing your software project. And the approaches are static modeling approaches. And then you have a dynamic modeling approaches. Now, in case of uh, static modeling approaches, basically you use you estimate parameters, before testing begins. Basically, you have to use uh, what we can call a static metrics. Metrics like, uh, well, software size, which is uh, measured in terms of number of lines of code, etc. There are a number of uh, static metrics that uh, uh, are available, and you can use them to estimate the initial defect density. You can also possibly use them to estimate the rate at which you will uh, find defects. And that will, you can do that before uh, testing begins. Now, in case of dynamic modeling, you estimate parameters. So you have already started testing, and you are getting some. You have gotten some data. Based on some that data, you estimate some parameters, and based on parameters, you make a projection of when you are going to reach your target reliability attributes. Perhaps the target defect density, or the target failure intensity, and so you can here use. You need to record when failures are found. Because then you will use this information to extrapolate to make predictions about the future behavior. And it could be time or coverage based. 